Morning. Sophie's away this week, and since Sky couldn't stretch to chat GPT, you have the next best thing. I'm Trevor Phillips. They told me it'd be a DOS this week. It's half term. Nothing much going on. They lied. The Prime Minister went to Munich yesterday ahead of what looks like a Russian offensive and ticked off an audience of world leaders, telling them that they need to double down in their military backing for Ukraine. He was a bit less forthright in Belfast, selling what might be a post-Brexit trade deal to a notoriously tough crowd, Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party. This morning, we learned that Boris Johnson doesn't think much of the Sunak plan and doesn't much like the agreement, though he hasn't seen it yet. Labour says it could back a deal. Keir Starmer probably reckons he can afford to be generous. When you're 25 points ahead in the polls, you've eliminated troublesome internal opposition and Nicola Sturgeon surrendering the spotlight, it pays to look statesmanlike. And then, to cap it all, there's a budget looming. Brace yourselves. In just a moment, we'll hear from the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Mordaunt. And for Labour, the party's shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper. With a deal over the Northern Ireland Protocol in sight, we'll try to find out how it might be received by Eurosceptic Conservatives, with their longtime figurehead and former business secretary, Jacob Rees-Mogg. We'll also speak to the former Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter, now Lord Mandelson, who can give us an insight into how they may be thinking in Brussels, given his time as an EU Trade Commissioner there. And we'll get a sense of the mood in Belfast this weekend from the leader of the Cross Community Alliance Party, Naomi Long. Let's start this morning hearing from the government. A few moments ago, I spoke to the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Mordaunt. Good morning. I'd like to start with the awful story of Nicola Bully, who's been missing now for more than three weeks. Both the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister have expressed concern about the handling of the investigation. Uh, do you share that concern? Well, I can't imagine what this must have been like for her family. It's bad enough if a, a member of your family goes, goes missing, but to have all this additional... Uh, drama and distraction from the most important thing, which is to find out what has happened uh, to her. Um, my thoughts are, are with them. I think the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary have been right to express concerns about that. But, but really the priority here has been what it always should have been, which is to find her. OK. Let's talk about the political news. And, of course, top story today is going to be Northern Ireland. The Prime Minister says that... We may be close to a deal, but we're not there yet. Uh, what are the obstacles that remain to an agreement that would allow Stormont to reassemble and possibly allow you not to have to uh, pursue the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill? Well, look, there are encouraging signs, but the Prime Minister has said that there is still hard work to be done and uh, everyone will be pulling together to ensure uh, that we're giving that deal the, the best chance possible. What matters here, and the Prime Minister is very focused on this, is what the people of Northern Ireland think about this deal. This has to be acceptable to all communities in Northern Ireland, and the EU is aware of that. So I, I wish them well. I think it would be great if we can arrive at that point, uh, but that's the test. It's not what I or any other member of the Commons thinks it's the people of Northern Ireland. But how close is close? Is it days or are we weeks away, months? What do you think? Look, I think, I think good progress has been made, but clearly there is still more to be done. Both, both sides of the, the negotiations have said we're not there yet, um, but those negotiations are still progressing and, uh, and there, are, there are optimistic signs. All right, well, look, um, people can be helpful and they can be... Less helpful. And um, let's talk about the various uh, parties to this. Some in your own party say that the European Court of Justice should play no part, for example, in settling disputes uh, between Britain and the EU on trade. Um, can you envisage any agreement in which the ECJ plays no part at all 
being acceptable to the EU? Look, I'm not party to the negotiations. I'm not cited on the detail. But what I can tell you is that unless this deal uh, is um, satisfactory to, to all communities in Northern Ireland, it, it won't be possible. It's not going to work. But it's also the, going to be satisfactory to the EU, hasn't it? It, it has. But the... I mean, the DUP's tests uh, that they have referred to are not a random wish list. They are promises that we have made to the, to the people of Northern Ireland. That, that is the, the bar that this deal has to, has to get over. And, uh, and I know that the Prime Minister is completely focused on that. Uh, you're in danger of being a bit clear here, which is unusual. The DUP's seven tests involve no role for the ECJ. Are you saying that this can't happen unless that test is met? The Prime Minister is focused on removing those practical difficulties, but he has also been talking about the, the democratic deficit. He's been talking about ensuring that the people of Northern Ireland, through their representatives, are able to have a say on any future uh, regulation uh, that they might be subject to. These are important things. It is very tough. It's tough stuff. But that is what the Prime Minister is focused on. I've no further detail on the, on the nitty-gritty of the, of the negotiations, Trevor, but I, I think there are encouraging signs, but there is a lot more to be done. Uh, absence of detail doesn't seem to have discouraged um, some of your colleagues from having a view, including uh, the former Prime Minister, who says, um, or rather a source close to <laughs> Mr Johnson, uh, saying this morning that... It would be a great mistake to drop the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. The story behind this is that apparently he thinks that it's absolutely essential to make sure that you have leverage, that you retain the ability to withdraw unilaterally from um, the, the protocol. Do you think it is possible to reach an agreement that would satisfy that part of your party? Well, look, I think the, the first thing to say is, and I think the Prime Minister would acknowledge this, we're, we're only able to be having these negotiations and discussions because of what previous administrations have done. And the command paper and the, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill have been helpful to get us where we are today. I think that's, that's the first thing. And uh, the intervention by a source close to the, the previous Prime Minister is helpful to remind uh, the EU uh, of, that, uh, of that bill and uh, what this deal actually has to deliver. But uh, I'll come back to it, Trevor. It's not about me or any other member of Parliament. It is about the communities in Northern Ireland and getting this to work for them. That is our priority. I, I know it's your job to be diplomatic, but seriously, you think that Boris Johnson's intervention is helpful? I think that all parties want this to be a success. They want those very practical issues that the people of Northern Ireland have been grappling with and that are uh, causing unnecessary friction in our trading arrangements. They, they want the, the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom to be uh, a, a certainty. Th this is what we all want. It's difficult. But we are making progress, and, uh, and I wish the Prime Minister well. But, uh, forgive me, I, I understand what you're trying to say, that there needs to be a consensus, everybody needs to be generous and so on, but it's already clear that for some members of your party, and I'm going to come to the DUP in a moment, there are red lines. Uh, John Redwood, who senior member of the party, he represents a particular strain of opinion, has tweeted this morning words to the effect that the EU consultation with the Northern Ireland Assembly would still leave Northern Ireland under EU control. These people are not going to come quietly, are they? They're not going to be as generous as you apparently are being this morning. Well, it's again, it's not about a, a winning a vote in the, in the Commons. We, we, we don't know what the... Um, following procedures will, will need to be. It, it all depends on what that, uh, what that deal is and if we, if we get to a, a deal at all. But uh, I, I think everyone is, uh, is agreeing with each other. 
unless we have every community in Northern Ireland behind this deal, it, it won't last and it won't work. We, that, this is why this is difficult. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's at moments like this when, when governments and prime ministers are tested and the prime minister is been absolutely clear that the priority in this is the people of Northern Ireland. That, that is what he has in his mind uh, and what his team have in their minds when they're negotiating. All right, well, I'll give this one last go. What, what is Boris Johnson actually up to? Well, Boris is, is being Boris. But I wouldn't say this is this is a completely unhelpful uh, intervention. I... Um, and I think, as I say, the Prime Minister, uh, I think, will acknowledge that uh, having the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill there, having the, the work uh, that the former Prime Minister did is has helped us get where we are. But it's always been our preference to try and have a negotiated okay. settlement. And, and that is what everyone is working to. There's All still right. a lot to be done, All but right. progress let... has been made. All right, let me take you a word about the Northern Ireland communities. Uh, the, the Democratic Unionist Party has been pretty clear. Uh, I've put some of the points that they share with members of your party to you already. Um, if they don't come into the line, um, Stormont is not going to reassemble. Uh, is the government ready to, for example, resume direct rule if the assembly simply just can't sit because the DUP won't accept a deal? So, look, we... We have, and we've, we've done this previously, we, we've had to step in. We, we obviously want to make sure that there's a, there's a budget there. We, we are the backstop for, uh, for, for the Assembly. That's, that's always been the case. But, but we, want, uh, we want government to be, to be re-established in, in Northern Ireland. That, yeah. is, that is what we, we want. And, uh, it's it a great, is, it's it a great is, aspiration, but you haven't been able to do it. And that's not necessarily your fault. If, if Mr Donaldson and his colleagues, Sir Geoffrey, I beg your pardon, Donaldson and his colleagues say, we're not going to play ball, are you ready to resume direct rule? Look, there is, there is obviously an element of, of local politics in all of this, but, but fundamentally, the, the deal that the Prime Minister is trying to uh, negotiate at the moment is, is going to be a key part of getting the Assembly stood up again. That is why it is absolutely critical that all parties have confidence in the process and have confidence with what is arrived at. We, we don't know whether we're going to be able to secure a deal or not, but if we do, um, and it's a good one, then that will play a big part in, uh, in getting the Assembly re-established. You're obviously very hopeful, and um, the Labour Party says that um, actually they will support uh, a deal if it's one that, for example, maintains uh, the integrity of the Good Friday uh, Agreement. Um, are you okay about that? That you might actually have to, if you have to, introduce legislation, and it's possible you might not to, but if you do have to introduce legislation, are you happy to? Uh, get that legislation through on the back of uh, Labour votes uh, against some Conservative opposition and DUP opposition? Well, look, this is a hypothetical situation about, about having a vote. We don't, we don't know what a deal is going to look like and whether, uh, whether we will need to, to do that or not. Um, I would hope, if we arrive at a good deal, that everyone would be supporting it. But I, I come back to the point, Trevor, and I, I'm sorry to... Um, repeat it, but it is a pretty fundamental one. It doesn't really matter what any of us in the House of Commons think about this. The deal has to satisfy the people of Northern Ireland. OK. All right. Um, elsewhere, Mr McLynch says that they're going to stop the trains again, the RCN, first time in its history. It's going out on a 48-hour strike without cover. Junior doctors yesterday say they're likely to come out. Um, is it the ministers... Is it minister... Minister's position still that it's not much you can do to stop this chaos. Look, I think it is political cynicism of the worst kind to encourage strikes. The only people that benefit from strikes are the Labour Party. Striking workers don't benefit from strikes. And uh, I think it's lunacy to say to people the best way to help make ends meet is to drive those ends further apart. These, these are not helpful. 
Uh, we need to focus on issues that, that each sector is facing. Those are what the respective secretaries of state are, are doing, but, but strikes are not helpful, and I would encourage people not to, not to do that. Well, I, I can't speak for Mr Lynch or Ms Cullen or the BMA, but I suspect that if they were here, they'd say, they're not, much, they're not very helpful to you, but they might be helpful to these striking workers. And let, so let me ask you again. It's going to happen. Is the government's view still that it cannot play a role in avoiding these strikes? Strikes are not helpful to striking workers. No, but that's not the question I'm strikes, asking you. Well, I'm asking it's, you it's, what the government can, what, can what do. Let me address what you said, because it's important. Striking workers lose pay out of their pay packets when they're on strike. If their union demands are met with an inflationary pay rise, they lose, because that equates to about £1,000 extra in tax per household, and you, you, it doesn't help on, uh, on the issue we, that everyone is facing on inflation. Strikes do not help striking workers. Strikes only help the Labour Party. But and about. it's the same attitude, Trevor, that, hang about, hang that about. brought you, you, miners you, you, out you've, you've on strike at the start of the warmest summer on record. It's the, it's the same old dogma and situation. The only thing that is going to enable us to make progress on, on the genuine issues that certain sectors are facing is, is discussions, yes. discussions around hang stresses on. on the NHS and, and all of hang that. Hang on, hang on. You're going, you're that is what secretaries are You can going tell them that there's not helpful to them till you're blue in the face, but from their point of view, if they get a pay rise, that is going to be helpful, surely. I mean, that's not what, it, they're, not that's what they're embeds, there for. Not if it embeds inflation. Uh, no, um, they, they are, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, a, it's but, a myth that strikes are helpful. They're not. They, they exacerbate uh, financial problems for the very people going out on strike. And they also are going to have a knock-on effect on okay. uh, cancelled appointments, on missed education. Uh, it's, it's not good for the country, and I'd encourage people not to do it. Yeah, but, they, but they're going to get poorer anyway because inflation hasn't been conquered, as Mr Hunt never tires of telling us. So they're getting poorer year by year anyway. Let me put it to you again. Is the government simply going to sit on its hands and say, look, you're not, chaps, you're not helping anybody. You're, you know, it, it's a little bit school teacherish. You're, you're wasting your own time here. I mean, honestly, no, the, can the ministers do nothing? No, the, the ministers are, are doing a lot. The, the, you will know that the prime minister's priorities, three of them, are, on, are focused on the economy, including halving uh, in inflation. Uh, that should be our focus. That is what is going to benefit those individuals. It will benefit also uh, the, the rest of the country as well. So we're, we're very focused on this. But uh, make no mistake, the strikes are not helping. All right, look, um, Mr Sunak said yesterday he wants everybody to double down to support Ukraine. Um, we're not sending fighter, fighter jets, despite the um, clear uh, the appeal that Mr Zelensky uh, made uh, to us, are we? Just to be clear, we're not going to send well, the fighter jets. Well, look, we, we've not ruled out uh, particular things, and indeed the Prime Minister has asked the Defence Secretary to look at a, a raft of things, including uh, aircraft, and we are obviously providing oh. training support. Um, but the Defence Secretary is also... He's very focused on what is going to help long-term but also in the immediate future. And the Prime Minister's speech at the security uh, summit in Munich was really a, a, a call to other nations to recognise the critical period we are in now in That's terms of Ukraine securing that victory. That's interesting. There was a world in which uh, Penny Morden might have been the Defence Secretary. Would, the Penny, would Penny Morden as Defence Secretary have wanted to send fighter jets if we had any to spare? I'm, com I'm completely in step with Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace, I think, has been a fantastic Defence Secretary. He is very focused on giving Ukraine the support that it needs. Um, we have led uh, Europe in providing that support, and uh, we're doing a huge amount, and we will continue to do that. What we have also said is we are going to step that up. I in the next few months, we're going to be sending more than we did uh, in the entire um, yeah. period of last year. And, and that is because we have to bring this, this war to an end. We have to help 
Ukraine secure that victory that is in everyone's interest. And this is a really critical period for them to do that. Uh, there, there are limits to what we can do, surely. Um, there's a, a former uh, chief of... Uh, actually, a chief of uh, Army General, um, Sir Richard Barons, who says today we need another three billion uh, pounds. We hear that the uh, a year to keep uh, our status as a leading European military power. Uh, we hear that the Defence Secretary wants another ten billion uh, a year. We understand that our own munitions uh, stocks are being depleted because we're helping the Ukrainians. Uh, are we going to do whatever it takes, whatever it does to our own military capacity? We know this is our first job as a government. Uh, and our record in government has been that we have prioritised uh, defence and we have kept defence spending strong, always met our NATO commitments. But for those worried about this, I would say, listen to what the Prime Minister said in Munich. Listen to what the government said uh, in the autumn statement last year, which recognised the need to increase defence spending. Look at what the Chancellor has previously said the son of an admiral, one of the most experienced yes. people in Cabinet, about his desire to increase defence spending to 3%, as he has made uh, a commitment in previous years. And look at Ben Wallace, um, okay. who no one can doubt his commitment to our armed forces. Okay. I am confident we will keep defence spending strong okay. and it will be the priority for this government. OK, I'm only hurrying you along because, of course, the big development, biggest Pure political development has been the decision of the Scottish First Minister to stand down. Um, no, nobody really knows the full truth of why she's made that decision, uh, but one element surely must have been the decision of the Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack to block Holyrood's legislation on gender recognition. Given what you yourself have said on this issue, do you really think that Alistair Jack was correct to do that? Did you support that decision? Yes, he was, because this is a matter not so much about the, the, the rights or wrongs or the merits of, of what Scotland was, was trying to, to do for trans people. It was about the impact it was having on the rest of the UK. Uh, there have but been many, many positive things about devolution, but it has torn at the social fabric of the United Kingdom. And the impact of what Scotland was, was doing on the, on the workings, as, as you will well know, of the Equalities Act, was a serious problem. But, Scotland but every, knew about but, this. But, but everything uh, that you have said recently uh, in the past, uh, including the period when you yourself were Minister for Equalities, suggests that you would have supported the Scottish legislation. No, Is that I, true? No, on the issue itself, I wouldn't have, because I did not wish for uh, this to be split out from healthcare. I think this, this was a very Im important thing that it remained in healthcare. But what we think about the merits of what Scotland were trying to do is not the issue here. The reason why Alistair Jack has done what he has done is because what Scotland was trying to do was going to have uh, an impact on the workings of the Equalities Act okay. across the whole of the UK. Penny Morden, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's get the view from Labour now with the party's Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper. Good morning, Shadow Home Secretary. Good morning, Trevor. We um, heard from Penny Mordaunt, if I may start with the Nicola Bully investigation, that she shared the Prime Minister's and Home Secretary's concerns about that investigation. Now, uh, you told my colleagues at, here at Sky News earlier on this week that you'd be meeting the Lancashire Police uh, to discuss the progress of the investigation. What, what, what can you tell us about that conversation? Well, this obviously is a, a very distressing case and a family that have a, a missing mum, daughter, wife. It's a, a very difficult case. And my uh, team have been in touch um, with Lancashire Police to have more information. But look, at the heart of this, obviously, the, is the most important thing is to try and find Nicola Bully. In the handling of the case, obviously, there was a lot of information um, released, and that was really unusual. And I think that's why there have been so many concerns um, as a result of this. 
But what's happening now is the Information Commissioner has said that they're going to investigate. We've also had there's going to be further internal reviews as well. I think the right thing now is for those to take their course uh, and for us to have further discussion of this in due course. But at the moment, for everyone to support the Lancashire Police investigation to try and find Nicola and also to support Nicola's family who must be in the most unimaginable agony as a result of what's happening. So you still have confidence in their uh, handling of the matter for the time being? I think the most important issue at the moment is the investigation into Nicola's disappearance and I think everybody should support that investigation because that has to be the priority. Let's turn to the um, lead story of the day, I guess, which is the uh, negotiations over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, your party leader has said that if there is a deal, which as Penny Mordaunt uh, said this morning, is supported by all parts of the community there, then Labour would support it, uh, if necessary, vote for relevant legislation. Do uh, welcome what has been happening recently. Well, I hope that a deal is imminent. We have been urging the government to act on this for a very long time. We've, we've put forward ways and proposals as to how that could be done. So we really strongly hope that, that a deal is imminent. It is uh, strongly needed. And yes, as Keir Starmer has said, we stand ready to support the government, to support Rishi Sunak in getting this through. We'll provide political cover for him if he has problems within his own party on this, because this is in the national interest to get this resolved and to get this sorted, uh, both for Northern Ireland but also more widely for the UK. This, of course, is all part of Labour's policy of uh, trying to make Brexit work. Now, can you imagine any deal being acceptable to the EU uh, that does not involve the uh, European Court of Justice? Well, we don't know what the discussions are that are taking place at the moment. There is also an element already in terms of the, the role that the ECJ plays. And I think that seems to have become a, a sort of big symbolic issue now for elements of the Conservative Party. The most important thing really is to have a practical programme that works. Of course, there have to be dispute resolution mechanisms as part of that. But it's to have something to work that just simplifies the process um, for trade. And we believe that there are ways that could do that that actually would be beneficial for the whole of the UK as well as for Northern Ireland, including we've put forward proposals around a veterinary agreement that would simplify many of the checks that are in place. But as you said, this is about making Brexit work. This is about being very practical. It is about getting agreement and talking to people. And for a long, long time, the way in which the Conservatives have handled this is just not to talk to anybody, just to get into standoffs, just to get into rhetoric, rather than to actually be really practical and have a common sense approach to that. That's what we would like to see. So to be clear, uh, the involvement of the European Court of Justice in, for example, the settlement of uh, disputes over the details of trade would not cause Labour uh, any, any problems in supporting a deal? There's going to have to be some kind of dispute res resolution process. Of course there is. So we should just be really pragmatic and common sense about approaching that. And I really, really hope that that is the approach that ministers are taking and then they're not going to just get all caught up in um, really the sort of the approach that the ERG, that the sections of the Conservative Party have taken to this. They've really got to be practical. It's too important uh, to just end up walking away when we need sensible measures in place for Northern Ireland and for the United Kingdom as a whole. But that's why we have said to Rishi Sunak that if he needs support in Parliament, we will be ready to provide support in order to get something through in the national interest. That's what it's got to be about in the national interest, not the political rows within the Conservative Party. The uh, political conversation is uh, moving rather uh, decisively to a place in which people are seriously considering uh, the possibility of a Labour government and um, the, your leader in his speeches this week and I guess the speech he will make today in Scotland uh, is beginning to sketch out what 
Labour would do. So let's talk a bit about what a Labour government might look like and talk about something very concrete. We can expect to see wave of strikes, uh, rail, health workers, teachers and so on over the next few weeks and months. We know that the Labour position is that it would be great if the Tories could get round the table and so on and so forth, so we don't need to go over that. Specifically, would a Labour government in London make the same offer to nurses as the Labour administrations in Scotland and Wales are making to uh, those workers? Well, we would get round the table and negotiate. Wes Streeting has been very clear about this from the start. In fact, he's called on Steve Barclay, he's called on Rishi Sunak, he's called on the government to get round the table. They really should be acting urgently because it, nobody wants to see strikes happen in the NHS, least of all, in fact, many of the nurses who are in such a desperate situation, they really want something to be done. So we should be getting round to the table and negotiating. Of course, you don't conduct those negotiations in public or on television, but we would be round the table talking about pay, talking about conditions, talking about the issues that are affecting the nurses and the NHS more widely. As part of that, we are also being very clear, we would increase the training and recruitment of more, dirt, nor, more nurses, more doctors as well, and we would cancel the unfair non-DOMS tax break in order to put that money into training the doctors and nurses we need. Because if we don't get the additional staffing, then the pressures on nurses, on our NHS staff, are just going to continue. And that is really bad for patients. So, so, without, asking you, so without asking you to advance a negotiating uh, position, the kind of deal that Scots and Scottish administration, Lab uh, Welsh administration are offering would not be off the, uh, out of question for you. Well, I think you are actually asking me to conduct the negotiations around the table. And, right. yeah, I think everybody has made clear that that's oh. not the kind of way that you do any negotiations. It's not the way that trade unions oh. do negotiations either. But the whole let, point let is... You, OK, let me ask you about a specific approach. question. You have to get round the table and be very sensible. All right, let me ask you a specific question about um, uh, Scotland. Um, your, your leader has said that he would not have supported the SNP's uh, gender recognition uh, legislation. The Scottish Labour Party did and whipped its MSPs to vote for it. Would a Labour government in Westminster, faced with a Scottish Labour administration that uh, wanted to pass this legislation, do what the Tories have done and block it? Well, the whole point, when you have conflicting legislation, again, is to be able to get round a table and resolve the issues. And that's what's happened every time in the past. So there are different issues that the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government can legislate on. There are other areas where you have UK-wide legislation. So, for example, the gender reassignment legislation, that is something that uh, Scotland can um, uh, legislate on. But we also have a UK-wide Equality Act uh, that's also important and that is the area that also protects safe spaces, for example, for biological women. So where you have a potential conflict between pieces of legislation, always in the past there has been dialogue, there has been a discussion between the Scottish Government and the UK Government in order to find a way through. This is the first time but, that but that hasn't happened wins, and that it? has broken down. And I think... Well, that's partly been because I think the, the, the reason that's broken down is because there's been a sort of standoff. Both the SNP and the Conservatives haven't wanted to have that discussion. So you have to have that discussion. It may be that you have to make changes in the law in order to be able to accommodate it. But we think that is the approach that you should take. That is the approach that we would take to any disagreement with or any conflict of laws with the Scottish Parliament. OK. Yvette Cooper, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. You're watching Sophie Ridge on Sunday this week with me, Trevor Phillips. And still to come on the programme this morning. In just a moment, I'll speak to the former business secretary and longtime leading light of the conservative Eurosceptic right, Jacob Rees Mogg. And a little later, we'll hear from the former Northern Ireland secretary during the Labour government, Peter, now Lord Mandelson.
Uh, with that deal on the Northern Ireland Protocol seemingly within reach, the Prime Minister has a number of groups to keep on side. The parties in Northern Ireland, of course. And a little later from here, we'll hear from those. Uh, but also, he has to deal with those in his own party who remain deeply sceptical of arrangements with the EU. They want the removal of the so-called trade barrier in the Irish Sea and want to ensure that the European Court of Justice no longer plays a part in the protocol. Jacob Rees-Mogg has long been one of the leading lights of that wing of the party. The former business secretary joins me now. Good morning, Mr Rees-Mogg. Uh, good morning, Mr Phillips. Now, I know we haven't seen the exact detail yet, but um, can you imagine yourself supporting any version of a deal that has a role for the European Court of Justice? Well, it depends very much on the position of the DUP, that um, under the Good Friday um, Belfast Agreement, it set out that there must be cross-community consent, and this requires uh, a majority in both communities. And, and the DUP have set out some very clear tests for whether or not any agreement works. And it's much more uh, about whether... EU law applies to what goes on in Northern Ireland, over which the people of Northern Ireland have no say, than the European Court. The European Court is a consequence uh, of EU law taking effect in Northern Ireland, and that's the matter that the DUP has quite rightly highlighted. So you, could, you can see some kind of arrangement where, for example, if the EU wants to make changes in trade arrangement, it might consult the Northern Ireland Assembly so that the democratic deficit about which the DUP is concerned is to some extent remedied. The actual involvement of the EU in uh, policy and legislation is not in and of itself a red line. You're, you're essentially outsourcing well, your DUP... judgment to the DUP. Well, no, because the DUP has set out um, its requirements, which I've, I've, I've got here. It, it's seven requirements for a new I know, they've got the seven which tests, seem to but me... I, I want to check on where you that, are. That's right. I, I think those seven tests are absolutely the right tests. I think the DUP has set out the right tests as to whether a new agreement is in line with the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, which is of fundamental importance because that's what's given peace to Northern Ireland for the last 25 years, and that must underpin everything, but also whether uh, Northern Ireland will have the same um, arrangements under Article 6 of the Act of Union as the rest of the United Kingdom, which has been the law of this country uh, since the early 19th century, uh, whether laws in Northern Ireland should be made by the people of Northern Ireland or of the United Kingdom rather than imposed upon them by the European Union. And that's what the ECJ becomes a consequence of. Now, I think the DUP's position is extremely reasonable is why I'm supporting it. Uh, to some people, this will seem a little bit puzzling. If the elected government in uh, Westminster, which is the highest democratic uh, expression, if I can put it that way, of the union, uh, decides it likes the deal, it will accept it, uh, it might be possible that one party or another or some members of your own political party don't fancy it very much, but if you, see, if you, basically, this is about sovereignty, if Westminster decides this is the way to go, presumably you're, you're going to say to the DUP, you've got to swallow it. No, that misunderstands the Good Friday Agreement. That... There's an agreement there that has led to peace, no. as I said, for 25 years, that means you need cross-community consent. And there was a very clear promise that there would be no uh, change to the constitutional arrangements of Northern Ireland without that cross-community consent. And the Northern Ireland Protocol itself says that it is subsidiary to the Good Friday Agreement. So that's really very important. And this, I think, um, alters the tone of the question that you're asking. Of course. Forgive me, we seem to be losing a little bit of what... Carry on, do carry Sorry. on. In, in Northern Ireland, because of the history, there is a very particular way in which changes may be made to the arrangements there. 
and those have to be followed, and that's one of the seven tests set out by the DUP. But you, you understand my point here, don't you, that in the end, uh, in our democracy, ultimately, whatever an agreement that was made in uh, 25 years ago may, may or may not say, whatever any individual party thinks, if Westminster decides that is surely the outcome of the sovereignty for which you have argued so vociferously, vociferously and if I may say so eloquently, for the last six years. Westminster decides. Friday Agreement, which is um, co-guaranteed by the British government. So you would be expecting His Majesty's government to tear up something it had already agreed to. So, of course there is... Okay. ...it feels like, but it has to legislate within a political context of agreements it's already made, and a, an agreement that is fundamental to peace seems okay. to me to be of the highest order of magnitude. And a government would not want to override that, Westminster would not want to override that, without going through the proper processes, and that requires the support of the DUP. All right. Before we move this on... This is um... absolutely fundamental. Before we move on, I want to talk to you about the economy, but uh, just very quickly, um, you will probably be aware that the former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has had something to say about all of this this morning. What's he up to? We are continuing, or whether we've concluded, or if we've lost signal. Do carry on. I think I can still hear you, Mr Rees-Mogg. Um, I was asking you... What do you think that the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson is up to? It is not usual for a former leader to intervene in this way at such a delicate moment. I, OK. I regret to say we may have to give up to, uh, on Mr Rees-Mogg on, uh, as uh, Alan Partridge used to say, on that bombshell. Um, I think what we should do is take a break and we'll be back with you in a few moments.
to come. Well, we've been talking this morning already to uh, Penny Mordaunt and to Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, and we hope to be able to talk to Peter Mandelson and Naomi Long in a moment. But just to remind you, uh, Penny Mordaunt and I talked at some length about the news emerging from the talks between the Prime Minister and the parties in Northern Ireland and the EU, which appear... I only say appear to be heading towards some conclusion. And here's what the leader of the House of Commons had to say. There are encouraging signs, but the Prime Minister has said that there is still hard work to be done and uh, everyone will be pulling together to ensure uh, that we're giving that deal the, the best chance possible. What matters here, and the Prime Minister is very focused on this, is what the people of Northern Ireland think about this deal. This has to be acceptable to all communities in Northern Ireland, and the EU is aware of that. So I, I wish them well. I think it would be great if we can arrive at that point, uh, but that's the test. It's not what I or any other member of the Commons thinks, it's the people of Northern Ireland. Well, let's now speak to a man who knows a thing or two about trying to strike deals between the parties in Northern Ireland and in Brussels. I'm joined now by the former Northern Ireland Secretary and EU Trade Commissioner, Peter, now Lord Mandelson. Good morning, Lord Mandelson. Good morning. Now, um, as Northern Ireland Secretary, you were responsible for implementing the Good Friday Agreement. Um, do you think, though we don't know the details of it, but what we understand of the rumoured deal, do you think that that endangers that agreement in any way? If we get a deal uh, over the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is an essential part of our overall uh, deal with the European Union post-Brexit, it will do more than anything else to support the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, it will reinforce the peace process uh, and help stop any return to the violence that we've seen in Northern Ireland in previous decades. So I'm hoping very much indeed that uh, the UK government and the EU have now found uh, a landing zone uh, for revising how the original Northern Ireland Protocol uh, was operating. I think that's an important thing to achieve. And I hope very much that they're going to be successful. Uh, you, in fact, did describe the protocol as, I think your words were not perfect. Um, does that mean that you think that it was inadequate as a basis for agreement or simply needed essentially some updating, some tweaking? What What is the... Uh, is it an obstacle or is it really something that we should invest in? It was an essential thing to, pre, to put in place, but the way in which it was done was not satisfactory, and the way it's operated since has not been satisfactory. I mean, Boris Johnson imposed it without consultation with the Unionists and others in Northern Ireland in the first place. He then uh, set about uh, repudiating it, having told lies about it to Unionists in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, and in the process wrecked our partnership uh, with the Republic of Ireland and did so much to destroy trust between uh, Britain and the European uh, Union. So I, I hope he's not going to come in and start wrecking everything all over again. Uh, a period of silence on his part, I think, would now be welcome. But here's the point, Trevor. Although the protocol itself is an essential part of the overall post-Brexit deal. It, it creates special trading ar relations uh, for Northern Ireland, which avoid uh, a, you know, a hard border being reimposed between North and South Ireland. In my view, the European Union, uh, frankly, approached its implementation in a rather clunky way. I've been mean, over-literal, over uh, overly strict. And I'm glad that the European Union now has decided to step back, reconsider, uh, and approach things in a rather more flexible way. That's what's needed now. I, I want to ask you about what they might be thinking about <coughs> in Brussels in a moment. But the, if we may, can I just ask you to, uh, about uh, the DUP and also about Mr Johnson's intervention this morning? 
Uh, he seems to be saying that we should retain the protocol bill as, not, uh, as an option, as a, if you like, a threat to uh, the EU. Uh, Penny Morden described his intervention this morning as helpful on the grounds that it would remind the EU, I guess, oh. that uh, this doesn't have to happen and that they perhaps need to make more concessions. What, what do you make of that? There's nothing that Boris Johnson is doing now or indeed uh, throughout our recent uh, history with the European Union that could possibly be described as helpful. He's wrecking. He's trying to wreck the thing um, because he's opposed to the Prime Minister. He wants he and his supporters want to undermine the Prime Minister. It's just a sort of continuation of the fratricidal war uh, that we see in the Conservative Party. So I really hope that Boris Johnson removes himself entirely from this matter. You know, we don't, we don't need him wrecking uh, uh, things uh, uh, anymore. Look, the, the, the point is this, uh, that in my view, uh, insufficient... Uh, attention, concern was shown by all parties, the EU and the British government, uh, towards unionist and other sensitivities in, in Northern Ireland, and they're repairing that, uh, and that's a good thing uh, to be doing. But it will also yeah. enable us, if we get this agreement in place, to repair uh, our relationship between Britain and the Republic of Ireland, which is so important. Uh, in continuing to uphold the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in the peace process, but also to rebuild uh, trust and to reconnect Britain with the European Union, not to go back into the European Union, of course, uh, but to get a sensible working relationship between us. You probably understand the, if I can put it this way, political psychology of Brussels and of Belfast better than anyone else, because you've had to deal with uh, both uh, cities uh, from the inside. The DUP says in one of its seven tests that it can't accept anything that involves, uh, if you like, a democratic deficit, i.e. EU institutions, including the ECJ, having a role in determining certain kinds of policies. The EU uh, wants uh, any kinds of disputes to be settled, at least in part, with the involvement of the ECJ. Is it conceivable that those two mindsets can be brought together? Yes, it is possible, and it's very important that that, that, that happens. Uh, look, the arrangements are that Northern Ireland, in a sense, is being given a very privileged position to take advantage both of the UK-wide uh, market and economy, but also uh, the opportunities that are offered by a special association with Europe's single market. And that's going to be very important, by the way, uh, for Northern Ireland's economic uh, future. There are real advantages, real opportunities now available uh, to Northern Ireland, and I'd like to you know, see those properly uh, realised. But I would just make two points about this. Uh, whilst the uh, rules of the single market will apply, however flexibly and, and, uh, 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 and, and wisely, um, there, there will be occasions when some arbitration is needed, and that's why the role of the European Court uh, comes into play. But I hope that, that, that the Court and its role uh, will be downplayed. I hope the European Court takes a very clear back seat in the operation of these arrangements. But secondly, and I said this to former colleagues of mine in the European Commission before Christmas, it would be a very good idea if the European Union, uh, in its approach to Northern Ireland, consults not just the unionists, but all the parties, the Northern Ireland Assembly as a whole, in it, how it goes about uh, operating these arrangements. And if they've got to be adjusted or changed in the future, then consult people, talk to people. And I think the European Union uh, are now mindful of the need to do that, and I, I very much hope they'll do so in the future. Can I talk to you about the other big political development, or another big political development of the week, and that is the uh, announced resignation of Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon.
So, it's goodbye, Nicola. Good news for Labour? <clears throat> I think it is good news for Labour, but, you know, what, what's more important for Labour and its electoral prospects is not what happens to uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, but, but how the changes that have been brought about in the Labour Party by Keir Starmer's leadership uh, are embraced uh, by the UK electorate uh, as a whole. The changes in the Labour Party are much more important to our electoral prospects uh, than what's going on in the uh, SNP. But of course it opens up an opportunity for us in Scotland. We badly need to win back seats. We've got a superb leader uh, of Scottish Labour, Anna Sawa, uh, who works very, very closely uh, with Keir Starmer. And I think that the opportunity now is for Labour not to offer a, a, a different version of nationalism uh, to the Scottish uh, people, but an alternative to nationalism. What the Labour Party will do uh, for the Scottish economy and jobs and skills, the health service and health care delivery, uh, transport, education, fighting crime. Yes. These are the big want... issues now on which to... the next election is going to be fought. I want to come to one, one of those big issues in, in a moment, but just very um, uh, quickly on the, on the politics of this. You talked about the changes in, in Labour. The Equality and Human Rights Commission this week uh, said that Labour was, in effect, out of special measures on the question of anti-Semitism. And the leader has, basic, has said that Jeremy Corbyn will not be a Labour candidate. Um, now, there's some question about whether he can actually uh, guarantee that, but... Um, is that the right decision, or is it just a provocation? Yes, it is. The, it is the right decision. Look, it's also inevitable. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn, who played such a part and was so instrumental in uh, in tolerating uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, so much a part of the problem, it, it has chosen himself not to be part of the solution, uh, and therefore I think his withdrawal uh, is inevitable. Uh, one very last brief question, if I may. Um, uh, Labour Party today is talking about uh, a new re regime uh, on the antisocial behaviour, uh, cracking down on people who are repeatedly uh, disrupting town centres and so on. Um, it struck me, reading their release, there was quite an echo of uh, something that was uh, said during your time in government, uh, to be tough on crime. Um, I look back to saw, see Jack Straw's comments about getting winos and squeegee merchants off the street. Um, not so much back to the future, but maybe back to new Labour. <laughs> now, I think what's important is that the, the current leadership and shadow cabinet front bench of the Labour Party, look, look at all that we did uh, as a government, learn all the lessons and then see seeing the new challenges uh, that the country faces, some of which are similar, some of which are new, you know, take what we did forward, adapt it, build on it. Uh, I mean, apply it to the second century, second decade of the 21st century. I mean, nobody wants to sort of turn the clock back. Uh, but I think that, you know, what you're seeing uh, in the Labour Party leadership now you know, there's a lot of sense, a lot of practicality. Keir Starmer has made it absolutely clear that he wants to fight the next election on the centre ground of British politics. Okay. And I think that, uh, you know, strong, modern centre-left policies are what are, are required by uh, the country now. Now, equally, there's a okay. fringe in the Labour Party that wants to contest that. Um, okay. My view is that the Labour Party can't make two offers at the next election. It has to be a Starmer uh, offer and not a sort of Corbyn-tinged uh, offer. Okay. And I think if those people in the Labour Party can't get behind Starmer, then they should be the ones who step back. Lord Mandelson, thank you so much for your time this morning. Pleasure. The hardest task in getting any deal across the line in Northern Ireland will, of course, be getting the different communities and parties to agree, and then to get back to the Stormont Assembly. The toughest nut to crack in this is the leading Unionist Party, the DUP, which says there must be fundamental change and they won't rejoin power-sharing until their requirements are met. 
Other parties have been deeply critical of that approach, the Cross Community Alliance Party amongst them, and its leader, Naomi Long, joins me now live from Belfast. Good morning, Ms Long. Good morning. Now, you met with the Prime Minister uh, this week, despite the fact that I gather they sent the, your invitation to the wrong place, uh, you did eventually manage to get together. Um, did you come away from that thinking that a deal could be done? Well, I mean, I think the Prime Minister certainly was reassuring in the sense that he was speaking positively um, about how the negotiations were going. But he was also realistic about the fact that there was a lot of work to do. And in Northern Ireland, we perhaps better than anywhere else understand that you can be 95% of the way to a deal. But it's the last 5% that is often the hardest bit to finish. So, near but it's still very far I think until a deal is over the line until it's agreed we we really won't know um, the final outcome but from our perspective we wanted to communicate to the Prime Minister the importance of listening to all of the parties in Northern Ireland and recognising that over 70% of people in Northern Ireland support um, remaining within the single market, want to have dual market access and that that is the bottom line irrespective of the DUP's tests. That is the bottom line for the majority of people in Northern Ireland. In that final 5% that you referred to, who and what is in that box, do you think? Who, what, where are the final obstacles? Well, I mean, I think that there are some of the issues. I mean, I was listening to Lord Mandelson and I think he very clearly set out, for example, the issue around a democratic deficit, the need for the EU to engage with Northern Ireland parties. I have to say the EU have been very willing to do that. In fact, they wanted to set up an EU office in Belfast where they could do that. And it was the British government that stood in the way of that and objected. So I hope that that will be dealt with as part of the discussions. But also, I think issues around, for example, the jurisdiction um, of the European Court of Justice is likely to be one of the sticking points. In order to remain part of the single market, there are certain things that we have to adapt to in Northern Ireland. And one of those is around where the final point um, of decision making on disputes will be. I mean, this is a fairly um, high level discussion. Unionism treated as though it is a constitutional issue. I think most businesses, I think most people um, treat it as though it is a pragmatic um, a pragmatic solution to a problem that needs to be resolved. If there are disputes, trade disputes or other disputes between Northern Ireland companies and those in the rest of the EU, there has to be a court that has jurisdiction in both in order to be able to resolve those. But I'm a pragmatist in this. If the EU can find a solution to this intractable problem along with the UK government, then I think that's something we would all welcome. But I wouldn't want it to be blown out of proportion. The reality here is that no business in Northern Ireland has been coming to me in a cold sweat, worried about the jurisdiction of the ECJ. What they're worried about is their ability to continue to trade into both markets and then to exploit that dual market access in order to grow our economy and bring prosperity to the people of Northern Ireland. Is, your, is it your point that um, an economic or trade problem and a practical problem is being turned into a constitutional issue and doesn't need to. Um, I know that you told uh, my colleague Sophie Ridge on this programme previously that the DUP are holding the people of Northern Ireland to ransom. Is that what you mean? Well, I mean, both. I think, first of all, these are not constitutional issues. In the Good Friday Agreement, it was set out very clearly how the constitutional position of Northern Ireland would be changed. It would only be with the express consent and will of those who live here. And that has not happened. There has been no referendum on that. So we remain part of the United Kingdom um, and unionism should be secure in that. I think in terms of holding the holding the people of Northern Ireland to ransom, absolutely that is the case. The DUP walked away from functioning institutions. They have left us without a government and now without ministers. And so we are in a, a rudderless ship, essentially, on pretty choppy waters when it comes to the economic and financial situation facing Northern Ireland. So, I mean, this we have no we have no leverage, if you like, in the debate with the EU and the UK. Okay, other than the persuasiveness of our argument. 
But I think it's wrong to collapse the institutions. There is no good reason why we could not have functioning institutions and as an executive collectively speak to the UK government about what the majority of people in Northern Ireland want, about the concerns we have around the heavy handed bureaucracy of the protocol and at the same time be able to move forward with the pragmatic politics that needs to be done in terms of reforming our health service, delivering education um, and improving our justice system. Well, in a way, that takes us on, takes me on to uh, an underlying question I, I wanted to ask you to address. The arrangements uh, for democracy in Northern Ireland are really ruled by the Good Friday Agreement. Now, we've had two lengthy periods where essentially there has been no devolved government, once because Sinn Féin wouldn't sit, once because the DUP won't sit. But Though they're able to achieve that outcome because of those arrangements under the Good Friday Agreement. Is it your view that at some point soon we're all going to have to reconsider whether that is the best way to uh, run Northern Ireland's uh, administration? Well, I think that the principles of the Good Friday Agreement of inclusion, um, of equality and of fairness, of working together is the right in, is are still the right principles and have stood the test of time over the last 25 years. However, I think that the, as it's been described, the ugly architecture of our structures and institutions here, which have embedded sectarianism and division, I think do need to be reviewed. My own party's growth is evidence that this is not a binary community. You're not either unionist or nationalist. There are lots of people who are unionist, nationalist and many other things as well. So from our perspective, we think that a review of the Good Friday Agreement structures is long overdue. We need to do that in order to ensure that we have stable government. You've referred to two lengthy periods um, of, of suspension. We have actually had now three lengthy periods of suspension, plus a number of other very unstable periods in the last 25 years. And I think when something isn't delivering what it said it would in strand one, paragraph one, which was stable devolved government for Northern Ireland, then we have to go back to the drawing board with the institutions and look at what can be improved. We have put forward fairly modest proposals in terms of how those structures could work better in order that parties could be still based on their mandate part of government. But if they choose to opt out, they can't prevent government continuing. And I think very few would opt out if they thought government would go on without them. They opt out because they know that it brings everything to a halt. And I think the government, irrespective of whether a deal is able to be achieved with the EU that satisfies the DUP's current demands, I think the government needs to do that reform of the institutions because inevitably there will be other political problems okay. that emerge down the line which could destabilise it in the future. OK. Naomi Long, thank you so much. I know that we'll return to that in due course, but thank you. Thank you. Now, just before we go, a quick reminder of our weekly podcast. If you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can find the Sophie Ridge on Sunday podcast and subscribe so it's in your feed each week. I'll be joined today by Alex Brown of The Scotsman and, as usual, by our editor, Scott Beasley. And you can find it and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Just search for Sophie Ridge on Sunday. That's it for this week's Sophie Ridge on Sunday. Normal service resumed next week. In a moment after the break, we'll run through today's interviews and see what we learned. I'll be joined by the journalist Anna Mikhailova and John Stevens. Thanks for joining me this morning. I think it's very important that we educate young people to understand about their fertility. I mean, I think we tend to focus on sex education as how to prevent a pregnancy. I think they also need to know that fertility is finite, that there will come a time when it's not going to be quite so easy to have children if that's what they choose to do. And there's an inevitability about, you know, understanding about periods and the fact that some women, you know, most women, well, it's an inevitability that women are going to become menopausal when they get to a certain age. Mm. So I think it's really about allow, I mean, ensuring that women have got the tools they need to be able to fulfil their fertility. I often say, you know, we need to make sure that every girl and woman in this country um, can make her own decision about if 
and when and with whom and how many times she becomes pregnant if she wants to. I'll say a little bit of personal experience. I was 34 when I started trying to conceive. I thought it was the perfect age. Um, I think that, you know, that was certainly what I was told in school, you know, focus on going to university, getting a career. Um, and after a year of trying to conceive, my partner and I were diagnosed with unexplained infertility and that was the a start of a decade-long struggle to conceive that involved a total of 11 rounds of IVF. So, yes, I'm very much with Leslie that we need to teach young people how not just how not to get pregnant but also how to get pregnant you can get pregnant in your 30s we're not saying that at all but it does get harder the older you get because you're born with your lifetime supply of eggs and they diminish and I also think um, it's really important to recognise that there are many routes to parenthood um, and reproductive science has helped that and there are ways of um, getting pregnant older, you know, through things like egg donation or surrogacy. But I think what's really, really important is that people understand all the financial implications, the ethical implications, the health implications of those different routes to parenthood. Um, so that's why it's so important that this education happens when you're young so that you know what all the options are to starting a family because we know that family is so important to people and that they have they have the opportunity to choose what is right for them and know all the implications of those. Welcome back. We're going to take a trot through our interviews this morning now. And joining me are the Deputy Political Editor of the Mail on Sunday, Anna Mikhailova, and the Political Editor of the Daily Mirror. Um, let me start with you, Anna. Uh, good morning, both of you. But, um, Anna, what, what, what stood out for you this morning from what you heard? I think the reaction to Boris Johnson's interventions were the most uh, um, interesting. We got we had Penny Morden being desperate to paint it as helpful, which is in <laughs> slight contrast to government sources anonymously telling everyone that he's a bloody nuisance this morning. Um, and, and also the, the evergreen quote from Penny uh, Morden saying, but it's just Boris being Boris, which I think you could probably apply to quite a few of the former prime minister's actions. Uh, so there's that. And then, and then similarly, Peter Mandelson, I thought, again, weighing in from a different point of view on, on, on Johnson's comments, saying that a period of silence would now be welcome. Uh, I think a lot of people would say the same about Lord Mandelson. <laughs> John, uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, the, you, you can't keep these guys down, can you? I mean, Johnson and indeed Mandelson, uh, they, they're, they're going to be in our headlines forever, it seems. Yeah, and I think Boris Johnson knew exactly what he was doing this weekend. There's been a vacuum because these negotiations are going on behind the scenes. Number 10 have been very desperate not to kind of give a running commentary. When Rishi Sunak was out yesterday at the Munich Security Conference, he didn't really give much away. They want all these things to be dealt with behind the scenes, kind of tee up the DUP, get their ERG people on side, make sure that the negotiations are progressing through. They don't really want to have these rows in public. And Boris Johnson clearly knew that the news agenda constantly needs feeding. You've got all of these Sunday newspapers. You needed to write something about the Brexit negotiations. And he was quite happy to throw this grenade in there, put this source quote out there, saying that if Rishi Sunak gets rid of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, this bit of Brexit legislation that he started going through Parliament, then that would be a mistake. And he got the result he wanted. He's on the front page of several newspapers. We're talking about him on your programme today. And it's Boris Johnson front and centre again, exactly where he likes to be. But just quickly, both of you, I mean, other, other than sort of attention, you know, any showman wants that, what is a possible political gain for him in this? Anna. 
Well, of course, there's the, the endless talk of a Boris Johnson possible comeback if Rishi Sunak does um, badly in the local elections. His allies have been quietly talking about a possible return uh, this year, um, by the end of this year, if if, um, uh, if, if things continue to, to 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 not improve in the polls for Rishi Sunak, uh, and then and then the, the other argument, which is it might just be cynical. Uh, trying to keep not only his name in the paper, as John says, but trying to keep his pay packet up um, and keep himself relevant with the uh, very big uh, paychecks he's getting for speeches and his post-prime ministerial life. So that's also part of the game for former prime ministers. You do want to have things to talk about so that you can also continue to rake in millions on the side. All right. Well, let's not um, get too obsessed by Boris Johnson's wallet. Let's uh, deal, as we do in this programme, with matters of substance and uh, the efforts to break the impasse over post-Brexit changing arrangement. Um, Penny Morden told us she's focused on what the people of Northern Ireland want. There are encouraging signs, but the Prime Minister has said that there is still hard work to be done and uh, everyone will be pulling together to ensure uh, that we're giving that deal the, the best chance possible. What matters here, and the Prime Minister is very focused on this, is what the people of Northern Ireland think about this deal. This has to be acceptable to all communities in Northern Ireland and the EU is aware of that. So I, I wish them well. I think it would be great if we can arrive at that point uh, but that's the test. It's not what I or any other member of the Commons thinks. It's the people of Northern Ireland. John, um, Penny Mordaunt was, uh, I think we used to use the word Delphic, i.e. couldn't really work out where she was on it. Now, is that, do you think, because um, they don't know how it's going to work out or whether it's going to work out? Or... Richie Sunak does, but Penny Morden doesn't, or they really aren't confident that they've got a deal. What, what do you think is going on here? I mean, I think it's a bit of both, really. I mean, Penny Morden clearly isn't in the heart of these negotiations. She's the Commons leader, so it will be her role to kind of set aside government time in the Commons to get this through, work out how do you do it, do you have a vote, do you manage to get it through in secondary legislation without MPs having a proper vote? That's kind of her domain. And I thought she was quite interesting on that. She said it's not clear that they will need to have an, uh, a vote when she was talking to you. But yeah, on the actual details of where exactly we are in the negotiations, she's clearly not at the heart of those negotiations. And perhaps because she knew she was coming on the Sunday programme, she's decided that it's probably better not to know the details than to come out blind. And uh, Anna, do you, do you agree with that? Or did you get any more than John or I got from her? No, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, she's she's sort of setting the scene as well for what would be the next <coughs> battle, which is in the Commons. So trying to make it clear that it's not it's bigger than any one member of Parliament. That of course uh, will send or try to send a signal to members of the European Research Group who are already have been coming out um, and and laying down red lines. David Jones has been making quite, despite also not having any knowledge of actual negotiations making it clear that there are certain things about the role of the ECJ that you just would not find acceptable. So the, the government is obviously looking ahead, um, assuming a deal can be brought over the line within days and uh, saying, you know, wh where the next battle lies. Even if there isn't a vote, there'll still be a debate and, and opposition from probably within its own ranks. OK, I, I, I did say we wouldn't get obsessed by Boris Johnson's um, wallet, but the truth is uh, we did start talking about his intervention uh, on the Northern Ireland Protocol negotiations, and uh, it's clear that already it's threatening to cause a potential Tory rebellion. Uh, now, Penny Morden said that the former Prime Minister should be heard. Boris is, is being Boris. But I wouldn't say this is this is a completely unhelpful uh, intervention. I... Um, and I think, as I say, the Prime Minister, uh, I think, will acknowledge that uh, having the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill there, having the, the work uh, that the former Prime Minister did is has helped us get where we are. But it's always been our preference to try and have a negotiated settlement. And, and that is what everyone is working to. There's still a lot to be done, but right. progress has been made. John, 
John, there are moments as an interviewer where you're sitting opposite somebody and you know, you think in your head, I know she's got to say this, but does she really believe that anybody really believes it when she says this is possibly helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think that was a generous interpretation on Penny Morden's behalf. And I think possibly she just didn't want to inflame the Tory Brexit war. She didn't want to say anything that kind of made Boris Johnson come out and make further remarks. But I think she did have a point on what matters here is what the people of Northern Ireland think about this, because the key thing that this uh, deal has to achieve is getting this Stormont Assembly back up running. We know that they haven't had one for several months now. The DUP are refusing to go back into a power-sharing arrangement. So, yeah, you can get a deal with the EU, you can get it through the Commons, but if the DUP still won't go back into that power-sharing agreement, then it's kind of pointless. And that is going to have to be the big test for Rishi Sunak. Does he manage to negotiate something that the DUP is willing to accept? Uh, Anna, do you agree that, in a sense, the DUP exercise a veto? Well, yeah, once again, DUP's role is absolutely centre stage. I, I think what we're seeing here is quite a uncharacteristically for Rishi Sunak's premiership strategy so far. I mean, he is taking a big risk here by by um, trying to get this all over the line and, and, and showcasing it and going out personally. So it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out because... There are quite a few hurdles yet to, uh, yet to overcome. Well, Northern Ireland's a big story, but it's not the only one in town. Penny Mordaunt had some interesting marks on the continuing campaign of strikes, saying industrial action does nothing to help working people. I think it is political cynicism of the worst kind to encourage strikes. The only people that benefit from strikes are the Labour Party. Striking workers don't benefit from strikes. And uh, I think it's lunacy to say to people the best way to help make ends meet is to drive those ends further apart. Anna, there's a um, long history about industrial relations, isn't there, that um, the public tends to stand off a bit and blame militant unions and so on and so forth. But as they go on, uh, the tendency has been for government to end up being blamed. Do, do you think that the government is playing this right by essentially saying nothing to do with us, really? Well, it's, it's part of the same old narrative. I mean, she once again uh, said that the uh, pay rises would be inflationary and um, she, like in the clip we just heard, made a real effort to pin this back at Labour's front door. So just sort of start, start, just start stirring, um, uh, infighting in and, and, and uh, confusion within Labour's ranks over, over strikes. But ultimately, as you say, I mean, the strikes have to be seen in the current context of double digit inflation. And I think that is where what we've seen is a different level of public perception to them, as even you say, um, we've seen historically, a lot of people, as the poll shows, have actually been on the side of uh, striking workers, particularly in the health service. And I think that is where, you know, um, Penny Mordaunt's, as you called it, school teacherish, school teacherish um, approach today doesn't quite land. You, just saying to people, oh, this isn't going to work, stop doing it, it does not seem to be a particularly viable negotiating strategy. Yes, I, I have to say, John, I, I, I now slightly look back and say, did I actually say to her, you're talking as though you're saying to Mick Lynch, you're wasting your own time? But anyway, um, your, your paper's been very vociferously in support of particularly the health service workers. Um, if you had to take a, a bet, uh, is the government's sort of view that in the end people will come to see it their way? Do you think that's a reasonable bet? I think the government has miscalculated the strikes right from the beginning. You know, at the start, they thought that this was, when it was just the rail strikes, they thought this was a tour they could beat Keir Starmer with and say Labour's on the side of the strikers. But we know that the strikes have spread from sector to sector. You know, they're now affecting ambulances, civil servants, teachers. We're now talking about hundreds of thousands of people getting caught up in these strikes. And I think the government's 
attitude at first was that they weren't going to get round the table with unions, that this was for kind of NHS bosses to deal with rather than ministers. Then after the new year, they backed down on that. They have had some meetings with union leaders. But if you look at the polling, there is still strong support for the strikers, particularly, as you mentioned, those in the health service. And I think that... You know, we get this continuing. People can't get appointments at hospitals. They're struggling to get ambulances. I think people will continue to question what on earth are ministers going to do to actually sort this out? And I think Penny Morden coming out on TV and saying, oh, if you go on strike, that's not particularly helpful for you. It's only helpful for Labour. As Anna says, I think most people will just look at that. It doesn't quite land as an argument. I think it's just a continuation of the government misjudging this kind of attitude. OK, um, b- before we go, we've only got a minute or so left. Um, you know, all of this is fascinating to us politics nerds, but I think for most, of, or much of the country anyway, there is, in a way, a more a bigger or at least a more affecting story going on, and that is the investigation into the disappearance of Nicola Bully. Um, Anna, I know your, your paper's really pursued this. What did you make of what Yvette Cooper had to say about her encounter with Lancashire Police, where essentially she said, we let them do their job. She did, but she also repeated her earlier critical comments, which was um, that the releasing of private inf- information uh, about Nicola Bully was unusual, as she put it, uh, which is obviously a, a, a euphemism there. Um, today, okay. I mean, there's so many uh, people coming out criticising this from the police. OK. I'm so sorry I've got to stop you there, but um, thank you both very much. That is it from Sophie Ridge uh, on Sunday and The Take this morning. Next week, it's civilised again. Sophie's back. <laughs>